Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. So as you get bigger, you have payment links into, say, your warehousing or your fulfillment team. You have payment links into your accounting software and your accounts team. Payments basically impacts a whole variety of areas in your business. And those have developed over time if you're a more mature retailer or there's something you're building now. So essentially handing it to a third party to deal with it the way the third party wants to do it wasn't going to work for these large retailers. They wanted to build some of their own product. They wanted links from their orchestration system into other parts of their business. So we decided to not only build this as a cloud company, but basically everything we do has an API, which means we can work with very large, more complex use cases than I think if we'd build this as a SaaS. John Lund, the CEO of Gravy, and he is our special guest this week. This is episode 111 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. John was born in the UK, raised in Switzerland, and about five years ago, moved to the Bay Area. John was employee number four at PayPal outside of the US. He also ran PayPal Ventures for five years prior to starting Gravy. Gravy is a tool in the cloud that allows companies to add, manage, change, and orchestrate their payment types without large engineering teams. They recently closed an $11.1 million Series A round and currently have 21 employees. John is passionate about making fintech and payments available to everyone, not just those with credit cards and the latest gadgets. He's a cold water swimmer and cycles hundreds of miles for fun. We've got a great episode today, so let's get started. Hi, John. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe more on the personal side. We'll dive into your professional background in a minute, but maybe talk about where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Sure. So weirdly, I was born in the UK, but I was brought up in a small Alpine town in Switzerland. So that's where my parents are based, and most of my upbringing was there. I then returned to the UK for school and then university. And then about five or six years ago, I actually moved over to California to the Bay Area. So that's where I live now. Okay. Well, let's dive in and talk about Gravy. Can you tell the audience what Gravy does? Sure. So the easiest way to describe what Gravy does is really describe the problem. And the problem is that every retailer in the world is essentially building the same product. So describe how that happens. When you start as a retailer, you add a payment service and that payment service will probably be fine to start with. But say six months later, you then want to go add something like a PayPal. And then six months later, you might want to add an Affirm or an Afterpay. And then you get a bit bigger and maybe you need another payment company and perhaps you go international. Then you need payment companies for international orders and the other ways that people outside the US like to pay. And essentially, as a retailer, you start with probably one poor engineer doing these connections. But as you grow and you add all these new and complicated payment types, that team that that is building those connections and connecting that to your business gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the problem really is that every retailer in the world is doing the same thing with an individual team building the same product. And so what Gravy is, is your payments team in the cloud. We essentially built a tool that allows a retailer to add, manage, change, and orchestrate their payment types based on where they're going without the need of large engineering teams, long roadmaps, et cetera. So really we're building a tool and what we're building is infrastructure as a service, a tool in the cloud that allows retailers to move quicker and really take advantage of payments. Is there a size of company that it makes sense for them to do this? I think, look, if you're very small and you're selling locally, you probably don't need orchestration. But the bigger you get, the more complicated things get and the more you need this as part of your business. So I think once you get to something over like a thousand transactions a month, then you really need to be doing some form of orchestration and looking at doing this as buying a product that does it rather than building it in-house, which is what most people do now. 
Okay. And you said retailer. So is there a distinction in your mind between an e-commerce company and a retailer? Will this make sense? No, I think, I mean, we specialize in people doing e-com, m-com, or basically selling online. So, you know, when I say retailers, essentially, I mean, someone selling something and that doesn't necessarily have to be a physical good. It can be digital goods, it can be streaming, it can really anyone accepting money from consumers for a product. Are there verticals that this makes sense or is it really pretty agnostic when it comes to that? It's pretty agnostic. I mean, I think the more international your business is, the more urgent the need for this kind of product becomes. But really, it's anyone who's selling and accepting payments. Okay. Okay. And how big is the company? We're small. So we launched in April. We're now 21 people. We raised a Series A back and announced at the same time in April, $11.1 million Series A led by Nike Partners. We're kind of starting on that journey. We're a small company, but we're growing incredibly fast. When we fundraised, I think we were four or five people. We're now 21. What would you say differentiates you from the competitors out there? I think our big differentiator is we're a cloud company. So we haven't built this as a software, as a service. Most of our competitors have essentially built orchestration as a service. So you as a retailer would connect to them and they would deal with it for you. We decided to go a different route for a number of different reasons. But really, when we talk to the larger retailers, firstly, a large retailer is not going to trust its entire payments structure to a nine-month-old seed-funded startup. But more importantly, there's a lot more complexity than being able to just outsource the whole thing. So as you get bigger, you have payment links into, say, your warehousing or your fulfillment team, you have payment links into your accounting software and your accounts team. Payments basically impacts a whole variety of areas in your business. And those have developed over time if you're a more mature retailer or there's something you're building now. So essentially handing it to a third party to deal with it the way the third party wants to do it wasn't going to work for these large retailers. They wanted to build some of their own product. They wanted links from their orchestration system into other parts of their business. So we decided to not only build this as a cloud company, but basically everything we do has an API, which means we can work with very large, more complex use cases than I think if we'd build this as a SaaS. Other big advantages, and we looked at where the world is going generally, and specifically in commerce, is this whole idea of digitalization. So most businesses are moving to cloud solutions at the moment. They're moving from owning their own data centers and their own infrastructure and really moving to using cloud around the world to deploy quicker and simpler. And so we said, look, let's take that and let's take all the good stuff that happens with cloud and let's translate that into payments. So we made the decision to build gravy in a way where we basically spin you up an instance of gravy wherever you need it in the world. So we can spin gravy up in a data center in Brazil, or we can spin gravy up literally any other location. But we can also do really interesting stuff like we can spin you up edge networks. And this comes into place with well, it's one of the trends that's starting to happen in fintech, which is all about data residency. So where is your data? How does that fit into local regulation? And so a good example of this is, I'm sure you saw recently, that India has basically banned one of the major card schemes from issuing cards in the country because essentially payment data was flowing outside India about Indian citizens. Now, there's a rule that's been set up in India that means payment data should not leave India. And so that becomes a problem. And the other case of this is, of course, GDPR, which is, is still kind of a hot mess, really, for U.S. companies. So these different laws are getting more and more common and require you to keep your data locally for in particular jurisdictions. So with Gravy, we have the capacity of spinning up an edge for you in that country. So for example, we could spin up an edge for Gravy in India, in an Indian data center connected to Indian PSPs, where your Indian client's data never leave the country. And that means that you can be in compliance, you can be in regulation. That's something you can only do with a cloud solution like we have with Gravy. Other great things we can do is we can burst your cluster or your instance up and down based on requirements. So, for example, if you're selling tickets and so maybe selling them for a festival, for example, you might have two days a year where kind of the wheels fall off as everybody is trying to get 
a ticket for the next great festival. And then the rest of the years or 98% of the year or whatever, that infrastructure is sitting around doing nothing. With gravy, we can increase the capacity of your instance up for 24 hours and then shrink it back down. And this is another thing you can only really do in cloud. And you couldn't do that if you built this as a SaaS. And then finally, while we look to this, our belief is payments eventually becomes a commodity. The price of payments should be a commodity. And therefore, we, when we looked at how we built this, we said, okay, it doesn't make sense in our heads that you are charged more to sell a car than it does to sell an apple. Because essentially, from a data perspective, it's exactly the same amount of data. So we decided not to charge basis points or a percentage of your transaction value for gravy. We actually charge you just like an AWS or a Google Cloud would. We charge you for the space you're using in the gravy cloud. So we're charging you for the you know, amount of data you want in your database, how long you want to keep it, how many processes, et cetera, et cetera, which means we don't take a percentage of transactions and means we're much more flexible for the large enterprises. Okay. Okay. I was going to ask about the pricing model. So you covered that. How do you go to market? Do you have a direct sales team or through partnerships? How do you go to market? We have both actually. So when we started the company, we built out a direct sales team, but we recently brought over Zubin. He joined us from Google. He was actually looking after Google Pay. He came over to Gravy to run our partnerships because we very rapidly realized that we are not only solving the problem for the retailers, we actually can solve the same problem for the people who are serving the retailers. So say that could be a shopping cart, that could be a bank, that could even be a PSP because our connections and our ability to spin these instances up and simplify payments for retailers, actually these shopping carts, for example, also need that service. So if you're a new headless shopping cart launching in the US, by connecting to Gravy and using the Gravy tools to orchestrate your payments, you could go internationally overnight. Otherwise, you would be busy building those connections to all the different PSPs and banks as you spread. But by adding Gravy, now you can become an international shopping cart. And really, it's the same problem. The shopping carts have big payments teams building this. PSPs have big payments teams building these things. And others, anyone really serving in the whole commercial space has payment teams. So why not replace them at the partner level as well as at the retailer level so that we can go quicker? So it's really a mixture of both. We will continue doing direct sales, but also we have a very strong partnership pipeline. Okay. Do you think that the most simple use case is just having multiple processors or going international? Or what do you feel like is the kind of common theme for when people come to you? Is that they're growing and they need this more simple solution? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's two places that we get a lot of, you know, people coming to us. Firstly, it's the retailer has got to a point where they realize they need to do something else. And I think COVID has really accelerated that. I think before COVID, there'll be a lot of retailers and maybe like 10 to 15% of their business was coming from e-com, but they still had very strong brick and mortar sales. And then along comes COVID, everybody's stuck at home, commerce moves heavily towards e-commerce. And the things were like, like little potholes in the road suddenly become massive holes. And the payment infrastructure that was perhaps not working at 100% of where it needed to be before but it could sort of be glossed over, suddenly becomes a glaring problem. So we've had a lot of large merchants and retailers come to us with specific problems where their payment infrastructure is essentially creaking or it's taking too long to update or change it. And we often talk to a retailer who's like, look, I really want to launch with maybe installment payments or I want to test cryptocurrency as a way to sell. For example, come to us and say, look, our own internal engineering teams have said, look, this is going to take us a year. This is going to take us 16 months or something to roll this out. And we can't afford in COVID to go that slowly. We need to go faster because our competitors are moving quicker than us. So we have a lot of retailers come to us in that situation. And then, of course, going internationally, this problem is amplified a huge amount once you hit international sales. So now, for example, a US retailer going to Germany where most U.S. retailers depend very heavily on credit cards. And you go to a country like Germany, which I think is still below 15% of the population even own a card. 
if you go to that market without supporting the local payment types, you know, SoFor, Klarna, and direct debit, et cetera, you're missing out on 85% of your potential sales. And so when it comes to that, if you have, you know, payments team with huge capacity issues with engineering lag, et cetera, and debt, then there's no way you're going to be able to move quick enough and enter those markets and address the payment needs of all the customers that you hope to win. So I think international speeds up the conversation a huge amount. I think you saw the news about Afterpay and Square, and I think there's more and more exciting new ways to pay that are coming up. We've got open banking in the UK, for example. These new payment types are popping up much more rapidly, and retailers do need to take advantage of them and lose less customers and gain more customers. And you can't do that unless you've got a very fast-moving payments team or a product such as gravy. Yeah. In fact, we're doing some podcasts around cryptocurrency and buy now, pay later. I mean, both of those just such a hot area in payments. And to be able to integrate that quickly into your payment stack is definitely needed in the industry. I think there's more coming. There's many more. (laughs) And, you know, the other thing you mentioned that really resonated with me is certainly the regulations in country and even the differences country by country. I mean, for a payments team at a retailer to know and understand all that and to be able to act on it is a huge undertaking. Absolutely. And I think the the way that we built this at Gravy is we built this no-code platform for our retailers that really means a finance person, a product manager can go in and add new payment types in a simple click and drag interface, which means you're able to experiment. And that's what a very core to our gravy philosophy is coming into this. We really wanted to allow retailers to play and try new payment types. So with us, you can go in and in a couple of clicks, add a new payment type and try it. Try it with your customer base. Maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10% of your customer base for a couple of weeks. If it works out, you know, spread it. If it doesn't work out, switch it off without eight months of engineering roadmap and all the pain that comes with that. And that's really core to why we did Gravy and the way that we've done it. Yeah, that's cool. So you mentioned earlier in the conversation about one of the trends that you see or things that you feel will happen in the future is the payments really becomes more of a commodity. What are the other things that you see coming in the payments industry, say, in the next two to three years? Well, I think, look, open banking is exciting, and I think it's finally coming of age. You've probably seen some large leaps in interchange rate, in, particularly in the UK, but actually in other parts of Europe. And that's kind of pushed open banking that's taken a bit of time to roll out, but it's actually pushed it to the forefront. So if you don't know what open banking is, it's basically in the part of open banking I'm talking about is the ability to essentially do a bank transfer in real time. So pay for something directly from your bank in real time, but for a bank to bank payment. So for example, if you're shopping online, the ability to have a check option that says, either pay with my card or pay with my bank. And then using biometrics, like log in with a thumbprint on your phone, you can make a payment directly from your bank to the merchant's bank in real time. And there's lots and lots of advantages for retailers in that space. I mean, it's a very low cost way to move money, much lower cost than they're using a card processor. And then on top of that, there's fraud protections, et cetera, et cetera. From a consumer's perspective, It's simple, it's easy, you don't need to be carrying a piece of plastic with you. And it's another way to pay. And I think the other fascinating thing about it is like anyone with a bank account, particularly in the UK and now more and more over Europe can make this payment. So it doesn't depend on a credit rating. It doesn't depend on being given a particular card. You just essentially need a European bank account at the moment. And I see that form of payment moving rapidly over to the US as well, where you'll see people being able to make real-time payments from bank to bank to buy things. And I think that's going to shake things up a little bit. It's going to change things, particularly around how much retailers are paying for particular type of transactions. I think that's going to be a big part of it. I think we've just started on the installment payments, other ways to pay. We've seen some huge innovations over in Asia that are slowly making their way over to US and to Europe. I know PayPal rolled out QR codes. That's something that they've had with WeChat Pay for a while now. So I think you'll see lots more payment innovations that some will work, some won't work, some will get consumer traction. And I think you really need a flexible payment orchestration platform to be able to play in that arena. 
We've talked a little bit about data residency. I think that's going to get so much more important. Sadly, the world is getting less connected, not more connected when it comes to regulation and legislation. And I do see merchants needing to be able to move as legislation moves and make sure that they're not getting into trouble by doing things the wrong way in the markets they're selling into. So I think a number of things are going to happen in that space. But essentially what it means is, is a retailer needs a platform in the core of their business that allows them to move quickly because otherwise you're going to get left behind. Sure. Absolutely. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. Tell us about your journey and how you got to be one of the founders and CEO of Gravy. Sure. So I came out of college many years ago with a degree in marine biology that wasn't particularly useful at the time. So I ended up teaching myself to code and looking for work in digital space. And this is early days. And, you know, very luckily falling in joining a company called Cybersource, which was one of the first payments companies, I think internet payments companies, back in 1997. So I joined as kind of the techie out in a small UK office. I think our US headquarters was above a barber shop in San Jose, California, and sort of hitting right the beginning of when e-commerce started. So we were one of the first companies able to process payments online for e-com companies. And we went through that huge boom in e-com and then out the end with the crash and ended up selling it to Visa for over $2 billion, I think. And so I came out of that, decided I wanted to stay in startups. I worked on starting another company called Passmark Security in the banking security space, still in fintech, ended up selling that to RSA. And then I was busy building, weirdly enough, an installment payments company and PayPal asked me to join. I didn't have time, to be fair. I didn't want to join PayPal. I didn't want to join a, a U.S. corp. But they said, meet the other three guys. So, you know, employee four for PayPal outside North America 15 and a bit years ago. It was a great adventure. Joined as the techie. Took PayPal from like the four people in a small dark corner of an eBay office to where it is today. And did a variety of different things at PayPal from starting as the techie to eventually running the lab then working on PayPal's relationships with developers, startups, I had incubators in four different countries, was running like the world's largest hackathons, et cetera. And then our CEO smartly said, look, we're doing all this stuff with startups. Why are we not investing? So then started PayPal Ventures for five years before I started Gravy, investing in fintechs around the world, learning a lot. All of that, as I was watching it, really drove me through the epiphany that was Gravy You know, I kept on seeing merchants. I kept on coming across merchants saying, you know, you guys should add PayPal. Be like, yeah, I would love to do that. It's going to take eight months. And we're like, it's three lines of code. How's it going to take eight months to have three lines of code? And then through the investing, seeing these cool new payment and fintech companies struggling to get merchant traction because of these payment schemes. It's not that the merchants didn't want to deploy them. It's just they couldn't or they didn't have the resources to deploy their products. I think that finally I met a merchant that said to me, look, I want to launch in South America. And my payments team is saying, basically, the parent is saying it's going to cost me $13 million per country and eight months per payment type. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do it. It really has. And that's where it hit me. It's like, there's got to be a way to do this. Everybody has the same problem. Let's just build a tool that allows people to do it. And that's when I decided, okay, I like being a venture capitalist, but actually I much prefer building companies. So I'm just going to leave PayPal. And I left PayPal last year and I'm going to build this company. So left PayPal last year, pulled a good friend of mine, Ali, out of his nice job at Yo-Yo Wallet, where he's the CTO. I pulled another friend out of Box, where he was working on a lot of their front end and said, guys, let's code, let's build this. The three of us, scarily, including myself, coded over the summer last year and raised a seed round, got ready and launched in April. So it was born out of frustration. It was born out of seeing everybody having the same problems. And, you know, I love payments. I love fintech and it was frustrating me and I wanted to do something about it. Yeah, that's a great story. So we can't go on without me asking, how did you come up with the name Gravy? So as you can tell from my accent, I'm from the UK originally and gravy is slang for money in the UK. So it works. We also like the idea of you want to make something better, you pour a bit of gravy on it. Now it came from that. Well, luckily I just had lunch, so it's not making me too hungry. Okay. So name something or talk about something you're passionate about, maybe one personal thing and one business related thing. 
business related, I'm passionate about doing things in the right way when it comes to diversity. And when I say that, a lot of specifically in Silicon Valley, we tend to live in a bit of a sort of crystal tower bubble where we kind of assume everybody's got, you know, the latest mobile device and is having their laundry delivered to their front door, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, a lot of fintechs that come out of the valley come out with products that are pretty specific to a certain class or group of people. And it ends up leaving a lot of people behind. And so I'm really passionate about how do we make a payment system or how do we make fintech available to everybody so everyone can participate, not just the very rich or the people with the latest gadgets. So that's something that drives me and definitely inspired a lot of how and why we did Gravy. So that's something from a business perspective. Personally, I'm passionate about so many things, mainly learning and trying new things. I'm constantly throwing myself at stupid either athletic or mental problems. So, you know, I'm a cold water marathon swimmer. I swim in freezing cold water, usually shock infested for fun, or I cycle, uh, you know, hundreds of miles. I'm one of these people that are just constantly experimenting with life. To give you a good example, I just returned from a trip to the UK. I decided, you know, partly COVID related, I didn't want to use public transport and was going to try and avoid cars. So I, I literally cycled and walked everywhere in the UK and I think in the two and a bit weeks there, I, was, I did like 277 miles of travel on my own two legs or with my own two legs and wheels. And it's kind of just a bit of an experiment, but that's the kind of thing I throw myself at. Okay. Well, I will have to admit, I think you're the first, and I've interviewed going on a hundred some CEOs, you're the first marine biologist CEO we've had. <laughs> We see molecular scientist. We had a nuclear submarine commander, but you're the first marine biologist, so I have to congratulate <laughs> you for that. <laughs> so the next question, and I love to get different people's perspectives on this, and I often preface it with I started in payment 16 years ago and sort of just fell into the space and you know haven't been able to get out of it since. But today, I think kids coming out of college, they look at fintech, they look at payments, and they see it as a hot, sexy industry that they want want to build a career in. So what would your advice be to them coming into this industry, young, not a whole lot of you know, experience yet? What would you tell them that they need to do to be successful? I think do this with care. So I think like a lot of technology, a lot of sort of the narrative is around disruption. And, you know, it's all about disrupt this, disrupt that. I think fintech is one of the spaces where you can't just disrupt. And I think there's many reasons for that. And one of the biggest reasons is you can go to jail, right? So <laughs> there are reasons a lot of things happen the way that they happen. So don't just go straight in assuming that you can disrupt everything or should disrupt everything. And I think, look, here's a good example of where that sort of struck me a couple of years back is there was a big trend in cashierless. I think there still is to a degree a trend in cashierless stores. So stores you're able to walk into with your cell phone, etc., take things off the shelf, put them in your basket or in your bag, and then just walk straight out. And the system would recognize you, know what you'd bought, bill you automatically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that, from a geeky Silicon Valley, you know, me, I get super excited about that. Like that's cool technology, but it being clear and actually the city in, of San Francisco pointed out as well and it became very clear that this was actually discriminating pretty heavily against a number of people who lived in the city that don't, one, have cell phones, two, don't have bank accounts, and three, don't have credit cards. So those people would now be excluded from stores if they went cashierless. That is horrible. <laughs> I think that's a horrible thing to do. And we have so much discrimination already in our society. We really don't need more. So I think like when you go into it, like I believe disruption is important. Things need to change, but careful disruption is for me the name of the game when it comes to fintech. Do think about why the rules exist. Do think about why they're there and don't assume you can just break them because they're a bit slow or don't allow fast movement because some are there to protect people or most of them are there to protect people and particularly vulnerable people. So fintech is great, but be careful and do things carefully and think about why you're doing them and why those thing systems in place. Otherwise, one, you could end up in jail, but two, you could end up hurting people, which is not what we want to do. 
Right. Well, John, we've covered a lot of ground today about the company, about your vision of the future of payments and about your personal journey. So is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I think, look, for me, this is a really exciting time. This is the next wave of where payments going. And I think, you know, I'd encourage people to look at, don't look at the status quo, look at how could I speed my business up? How could I speed up innovation if I didn't have to do this work in a custom fashion every time? How could I put in a tool and really get to a point where I'm enabling all kinds of consumers to pay for the products they want in the way they want at my business? And I think that's saying now is the time to do that. This is the next wave and it's really starting to take off. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. So, John, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for your time, Greg. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 